morning, afternoon, or evening uh, to those of you who have joined us from different time zones all over the world. On behalf of Philips, where I'm senior advisor, I'm especially delighted that you're here with us, what I believe to be a conversation about a historic and most ambitious work in the NFT space entitled, Will Your Heart Pass the Test? I'm here with the distinguished and incredibly innovative artist, Drew Kataoka, who has worked with a major film studio for five months to accomplish her goals with this amazing uh, work of art. Uh, Drew is at her studio in Northern California, and I'm still in Miami recuperating from Art Basel Week. And while among my very astute colleagues at Phillips, I'm probably viewed as the traditionalist in this new wave of technology, I jumped at the opportunity to talk with Drew today and to have had the pleasure of speaking with her on several occasions during the past few days, which greatly enhanced my knowledge of the how of the non-fungible token or NFT within the art world, and also the why she has devoted herself to this incredible project. Of equal importance, these conversations also gave me greatly enhanced insight regarding Drew's incredibly accomplished and meaningful works of art leading up to Will Your Heart Pass the Test? Phillips's online auction is already in progress. And after our conversation, you can go to phillips.com slash pass the test, all one word, to register to bid on this extraordinary work of art. So, Drew, not only am I thrilled to be here today with you and to talk to you about the questions I had myself, but also the questions I know our audience has. I'm only sorry we have only an hour to be together. But before I begin with my questions, perhaps you can tease us with some highlights of why everyone online should listen to our every word and the entire discussion. Well, thank you so much, Arnold. It's wonderful to be with you here today. And we're gonna go behind the scenes today on a project of unmatched scope and depth in the NFT space. We're gonna talk about how we did it, why we did it, uh, the ancient stories woven in from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. We're gonna talk about Web 3.0 uh, and also Social Impact 3.0. Talk about how alongside the digital NFT in this auction, the absolutely gorgeous physical prize that is in store for the winner of the auction. Uh, just last week, we had official Phillips representation on the ground in Los Angeles to catalog that part and photograph it and ship it and get it on its way to New York. So we'll also talk today about the future of the NFT space and why there's so much at stake for all of us in this space. And I'd also uh, like to say, uh, I'd also like to say that, um, you know, if anyone would like to direct message me, my DMs are open on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, we'll try to take some questions filtered through different channels, but we have a lot to cover. Well, uh, Drew, I appreciate that. You know how traditional I am. I still use the telephone, um, but that's okay. Um, but everything you said was certainly keeping me listening intently to the rest of this program. But before we go on, the first thing I think everybody wants to know is who is Drew Kataoka as a person and especially as an artist? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm off mute. I just want to make sure I'm off mute. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, well, I am an artist, a technologist, an activist, and a CEO of Drew Kataoka Studios. We're the leading full stack art studio in Silicon Valley, and we have collectors in over 30 countries and five continents. And, you know, Arnold, we started literally from zero 20 years ago when people did not believe that the San Francisco Bay Area could sustain a major independent art studio. And if you fast forward to today, we have a global footprint. We have a who's who of collectors, 
that I'm very proud of, not just in Silicon Valley and not just in the tech space, but also um, much beyond that. And some highlights of our journey are creating a scientific conceptual artwork for the first zero gravity art exhibit in space at the International Space Station, um, being recognized as a young global leader and cultural leader of the World Economic Forum, which is something that really only a handful of visual artists uh, can say that they have been in that category. And those include JR and uh, my colleagues, Olafur Eliasson and a few others. And very recently, I was the first visual artist to be selected as the icon of Clubhouse, which is the fast growing and transformative social media app um, that has millions of users worldwide. I would say that the philosophical roots of my art are in Zen Buddhism. I was originally trained in ink painting in Tokyo, which is where I was born. And that um, really started my fascination with negative space, this empty space between the brush strokes, that very important open space for the artist, the artwork, and the viewer to interact, to create kind of a playground for the imagination. Um, the Zen aesthetic has been fundamental for my development as an artist, but the other formative influence, Arnold, has been Silicon Valley, really the excitement of the most cutting edge concepts, platforms, and technologies. Uh, and by the way, Zen has played a very important role in Silicon Valley as we know it today. As a young artist, I chose to attend Stanford University. I, I felt that art schools were doing a terrible job of preparing us for this thing called the fourth industrial revolution. And I studied a lot of art history and humanities, but I also studied computer science, advanced math and natural sciences. And after graduation, I had a strong interest from a number of galleries I joined one, but I was quickly disillusioned by a lot of the sexual harassment and what I felt were very exploitative and unworkable business terms. 50% typically goes to a gallery, as you know, and they were trying to control all sorts of aspects of my creative process and business relationships. And so I did something radical, which was to take everything back in house and then build my art studio step by step. Um, independently outside of the system and model my studio after the successful startups that my classmates were building in the technology space. I mean, they were breaking all the rules in their domains. And so I said, you know, why not? Why shouldn't we do this in art as well? So um, as I said, today we're shipping to collectors around the world and we're working primarily in three genres. The first are the Ambrosia series, which you see right here. A great majority of the works that we ship around the world. Um, this is a signature type of artwork for us. It's colorful, it interacts powerfully with the light. It's an interactive art form that we've developed with over 196 billion configuration permutations. And it's inspired and influenced by neural networks, which is the leading family of artificial intelligence models applied in technology over the recent years, as you know. Um, you can think of the signal, i.e. the light, bouncing through the layers, reflecting, refracting, obfuscating, modifying, just like in a neural network. And it's kind of, a, in a way, a new form of uh, living cubism, if you will. Uh, the next genre of work that we're uh, known for is celestial lace. And this is mirror polished stainless steel. Uh, stainless steel, the highest grade brought to the highest level of mirror polish finish. Uh, it is our high end bespoke, high touch sculpture where the distinguishing vocabulary is this fragmented surface. And um, you see here a piece uh, which was privately commissioned by one of the most legendary and well-liked, I should add, tech tycoons alive today who owns this piece. And you can see this is a little behind the scenes of just how much work is lavished on each of these pieces, but the end result is they end up looking like big polished jewels. And then of course, the third area would be that we've been working in is technology art, which takes many shapes, but one big area is virtual reality and uh, 3D digital creation. But we also work with other genres. We've been pioneers in uh, EEG brainwave art and scientific conceptual art. Well, um... Now, now I know why your work is already, uh, uh, I would say, interstellar, uh, considering it's on the um, space station uh, floating out around the world. But um, uh, I think the, the next question for me, uh, I'm kind of overwhelmed by your answer, but the next question for me, uh, and I'm sure for many of our viewers this evening who are saying and listening to us, slow down, I want Drew to explain exactly 
what a non-fungible token is and what is, what is its significance in the world of art today and to us as a nation, as a human being. And why should I, as a collector, consider acquiring one, especially considering acquiring, will your heart pass the test? A phrase that, Drew, I have to tell you, I can't stop thinking about. Thank you, Arnold. It is like a koan, and it is designed to embed itself in your brain. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, you've been thinking about it and that it's spoken to you. Well, a, a non-fungible token is a unique and non-interchangeable unit of data that's stored on a digital ledger or blockchain. And NFTs can be reproducible files like photos or videos, but in the future, we're gonna see the shift uh, more and more to full virtual reality worlds. Um, the platforms don't quite support that yet, but that's going to be happening very fast. NFTs use a digital ledger um, to provide a public certificate of authenticity or proof of ownership. And uh, one caveat, ownership could be in your real name or it could be under a pseudonym. It's really up to you. So NFTs are really a big deal. They're a technological and mathematical feat but at the same time, they're very user-friendly and they solve some decades-old problems in managing and selling digital assets. Uh, Arnold, I don't know if you remember the early 1990s when people asked, what is this weird thing called the internet and why in the heck would we use it? Um, Believe me, I rem Drew, I remember very well. I was one of the people asking that. <laughs> I, I, well, a lot of people, it was pretty much 99.9% .9 of the population was asking that question. And, and those of us who were very early adopters, our answer was, you're going to use it and you'll use it for everything, entertainment, sports, commerce, academia, media, like work, play, government, mil the military. And, and, and that was web 1.0. But now we're at this point where people are asking the same question. What in the heck is an NFT? And why in the heck would we use it? <laughs> And the answer is, again, the same. It's simply put, it's everything. Everything that can be transformed into an NFT will be transformed into an NFT. And that's why sports, Hollywood, the art world, everyone is just scrambling to get metaverse capabilities and to wrap their heads around this fast-moving technologies. And, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this, uh, Arnold. NFTs are not the future of art. They are the present. And yet, you know, it's totally understandable that many collectors haven't caught up with this wave because it's just moving even faster than things moved in web one. And so that's why it is advantageous to get in early. And actually it is still very, very early. It's a great time to get in. The challenge is there's just so much junk out there. And for collectors who are not as digitally savvy, um, it's, it's hard to distinguish sometimes. I mean, like, for example, a digital work that's like hacked together over the weekend using a lot of prefabricated libraries is oceans apart from a work like Will Your Heart Pass the Test, um, which we're talking about today and which is live at phillips.com slash pass the test, where it's just like the sheer number of human hours is staggering that's gone into it. And just so much care has been lavished on each pixel. Um, the artwork, Will Your Heart Pass the Test, as you know, uh, and as our audience may know, is a collaboration between my studio and Industrial Light and Magic, uh, ILM X Lab, which is a part of Lucasfilm, which is a part of Disney. And the rendering farm at Industrial Light and Magic is called the Death Star, uh, with a nod to Star Wars mythology. And the Death Star houses this massive cluster of computers. And for our particular project, we had our own dedicated rack of 18 computers strung together just to crunch the numbers on the rendering of each frame, which took 23 days for the most advanced computers and GPUs that money can buy. And so um, our artwork is really a technological and artistic feat of uh, unmatched proportions. And, and that, really, that really stands apart from the, from the crowd in the NFT space. Uh, and I think it's, it's great that you're, you, that people like you and uh, Rebecca are really help curating and navigate collectors through this space because it's overwhelming. Yeah, it certainly is of the moment, but I keep thinking to myself at dinner one night, I can't ask my wife to move that small painting 
from the living room to the dining room uh, because I can't see it that evening. But joking aside, what inspired you to do this current work, especially in the form of an NFT? What, was, what moved you to go in this direction uh, at mm -hmm. this moment in your career? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have been active in digital art for many years, actually. I had my first no. experience of, of virtual reality uh, in the early 2000s. And you can see actually this photograph on the left is what the very early VR headsets looked like. This was a, a rack that was in Stanford University's virtual reality lab, which looks like medieval torture gear because it was like so heavy at that point. Those were the very early days. And, um, you know, I, I, I the, back, in, back in those days, the, the, the equipment was just so heavy. It, the whole apparatus was like the size of a small bunk bed, but it fascinated me. And over the years, I've been involved with both um, Oculus and Google VRs, not only their suite of products, but their, their teams and helping give them feedback on what they were developing. Um, and they have built the two main creative suites for native VR creation. Uh, I've also been an advisor on, on technology and creative experience there. So I've been a, also an early adopter of Adobe and Unity's digital art creation platforms. And the NFT space is in many ways a natural extension of these very big trends and a natural step of the evolution towards the metaverse. It, it solves a major problem that existed before with digital art, which was like, how do we you know, Arnold, how are we going to document provenance and ownership and uniqueness of a digital artwork? And now with NFTs and blockchain technologies, we now know exactly who the owner is and you can't fake it. And we can very easily verify the authenticity of a piece. Um, and so digital art becomes just like physical art in that respect, only thanks to this technology. Uh, and the possibilities are endless and really only capped by our skills, our imagination, our time and effort that we put into uh, a piece. So this time is um, very exciting and, and very transformative. Yeah, uh, you know, just listening to you is so exciting um, and makes me feel that I have to do, uh, you help me so much to understand what was going on. But every time I hear you speak, it makes me feel that I just have to do more and more to become, um, to adapt more to what's happening today. And I know one thing, that the NFT space has really been hot this year in terms of galleries, auction houses, collectors. Um, how does, will your heart pass the test fit into the overall NF landscape right now? Well, Arnold, you mentioned that it's like drinking from a fire hose of information. And um, <laughs> <laughs> if I can paraphrase, uh, and uh, I'm also always in a learning mode. And I think everybody in this space uh, should uh, just take that approach. And it, it's a very exciting time. There's no point at which any of us are done or finished. So we are uh, on this journey together and it's very, very exciting. So yeah, you're totally right. Um, NFTs are on the rise and, and for very good reason. Um, it's a new technological and artistic paradigm. It's just gonna change fundamentally, not just the art world, but the ways in which we live and work and, and govern and play. I mean, I've been talking to some journalists and they've been asking questions about, oh, well, this is how about this with art and how about this? And, and I'm saying, yes, all of that. But, you know, this is actually about all those other uh, domains as well, because NFTs are transforming fields as diverse as entertainment, sports, business, finance. And um, th they, along with this whole, you know, metaverse revolution are a really big deal. But despite the huge proliferation of the quantity of NFTs, there's been a relative lack of quality and a relative dilution in quality. And, and for me, um, this is concerning because we're starting a new wave of transformation, just like uh, the Renaissance seven, eight centuries ago. And we, we need our North Stars. We need our Sistine chapels and our Davids and our Mona Lisas and our school of Athens 
Um, and, you know, this nascent uh, NFT space, it's a little bit finding its feet right now. For me as an artist, uh, I have always said for as long as I can remember that at our studio, our measuring stick is immortality. Uh, and that's like a big ambitious goal. But what it means for me is, will what we create matter a century later or centuries later, or, or will it just be a fad? And how will people in, in future eras look upon and judge um, what we've created? And actually, uh, you know, I think, I think so many of the great artists have asked this question over and over again throughout the centuries. But for us now in the year 2021, it becomes even a more complex question because when we talk about creating for immortality, we have to answer the question, not just how does a human audience going to respond to our work, but as we approach the impending singularity, we have to ask ourselves this question that uh, the audience for our art may not just be human, but in a thousand years or, uh, you know, X number of hundred years, it will be a hybrid form of uh, artificial intelligence and human, if not eventually entirely uh, interpreted by uh, AI. So that's something to, to bend oh. our, our brains over <laughs> our morning My coffee. God, <laughs> Drew, I don't know what, you know, I don't dream a lot, but I think, uh, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have, I hope, uh, fascinating dreams and thoughts about this and not some, um, not, not some nightmares, uh, but, but well, using well, can, that I just word, just add, can I just add one last thing on, on that? Sure, on that. No, sure, I just want to say, so, so that is the goal with this NFT and you see a screenshot of it. And for those people who are just joining us, we're talking about, will your heart pass the test, which is live, uh, auction, on the auction platform, phillips.com slash pass the test right now. Um, and, you know, that's the goal with this NFT. We want to set a new standard, not just for our fellow creators, but for our era and frankly, for future generations. And that's why this artwork is, is really a, a piece of unmatched scope and ambition in the NFT space, period, full stop. In terms of the size of the team, the sheer volume of talent and hours of creative energy, um, the amount of time lavished on every detail of complex reflections of the heart, um, the hues, the shadows and the feather, every little detail has been agonized on and perfected. Uh, just like the greats of the Italian Renaissance really, who, who inspire me every day. Um, you know, we had a team of about 40 people um, across four time zones, Singapore, London, San Francisco, Bay Area, Las Vegas, um, who are all absolute experts and perfectionists in their particular domain, the best compositors, the best um, uh, texture mappers, um, the best moto specialists, the best um, sound specialists. We had the whole Skywalker sound team work with me to create the soundtrack where you'll see that in the uh, artwork, if you listen to it on the Phillips website, my heartbeat is something you'll hear. So actually I captured my heartbeat and embedded it in the piece um, along with some excerpts of an original composition that I performed on my uh, gold flute. And so you'll hear that as well. And on top of that, there are not tens, not, not dozens, but hundreds of Easter eggs that are inside of this piece. So you can look at it and look at it and look at it, and you're gonna find all sorts of things and puzzles to uncover and think about and mull over. My goodness. Um, um, it's, it's uh, that, that word mind boggling uh, comes right to the surface. But I wanna do something right now that I think is really important here for everyone to understand. And having been director for almost two decades of the Brooklyn Museum with one of the greatest collections of Egyptian art in the world, I'm particularly interested in the work's source in an ancient Egyptian myth and in using that source to speak to its relevance in the world today. It's really fascinating, Drew. Can you speak to that? Certainly. Um, 
And I think the work that you've done over the years at the Brooklyn Museum is just extraordinary. And it's so awesome that you captured some of that with Sensation, which is a, a book that everyone should go out and read two or three times because <laughs> it's so relevant to the times that we're living in. And also, I really admire that you've been... Um, not only a cultural leader, but a, but an activist uh, yourself. And, and you and I have had several different chats about this. Uh, and it's really important to stand up for things that you believe in. As, as Martin Luther King says, the time is always right to do right. And we'll talk about that later. But on the it's subject of ancient true. Egypt, <laughs> on the subject of ancient Egypt, as, which, which you ask um, as, as an art historian uh, yourself, for me, ancient Egypt is, is really it's one of the peaks of human civilization. It's profound and it's poetic and technologically incredibly advanced and really culturally divine. And among the myths of ancient Egypt, one has always stood out to me. I've really liked it since the time I was a little girl, actually. It was this uh, myth uh, about the weighing of the heart and the feather from the very famous Egyptian Book of the Dead. And the myth goes that, you know, when a person dies before they go to the afterlife, they have to pass through a series of tests and obstacles. And these tests, you know, what fascinates me is like, they represent the oldest written moral code in history. And yet they're surprisingly fresh and relevant to our time. And they range from things like taking care of the weak and the poor to protecting the, the, the Nile River against pollution. Um, but the very last step, the big showdown is when a dead person's heart gets weighed against a feather. And this, in my mind, is really the origin of, of the last judgment, really, in all great religions. And it's just so powerful and so profound. And I think this story and its derivatives, I mean, I've always thought, um, that that this story and its derivatives have have shaped the human spirit for the better, like few others, and it's really made us better people. And there's so many things we can trace back to this. Um, it's really the origin of moral accountability, and it's also something that arose 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. And just to put it in context, that's that's like a thousand years before Buddha, 1,500 years before Christ. 2000 years before Muhammad. I mean, it's, it's really um, inspirational to me as an artist. And so I wanted to interpret this scene and you see it here on the screen, which is a screenshot from our NFT that we're talking about today. And if, will your heart pass the test? I wanted to interpret this scene, but for today's time. So our scene is both ancient and modern. It's the visual vocabulary is both Egyptian, but also um, borrowing from Jukatelka Studios, where we are borrowing the visuals of our Ambrosia artworks, which are uh, the ones that I were inspired by neural networks I was showing earlier. You can see it in the heart. Um, and and uh, there's all, the, all these historical and all all allegorical references as well. So uh, that that's, uh, that's, that's a bit about how this connects to, to ancient Egypt. Oh. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone uh, paid a lot of attention to that because I think it's really important um, in terms of this work of art. But moving back home uh, from the pyramids, um, I think it's really, it's very important to know that the proceeds of the sale of this work will go to two critically important not-for-profit organizations, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for nonviolent social change and stop AAPI hate. And Drew, I know you have a relationship for quite some time with these two very important organizations, but could you tell us about why you selected them now to be the beneficiaries of the auction's proceeds, which we all hope will be considerable? Well, um, 
since my early years as a very young artist, I've been tremendously inspired by the words and deeds of Martin Luther King Jr. And in my early youth, I, I just spent so many days and nights listening to his speeches and falling asleep to them. Um, he really represents one of the peaks of human civilization. And I think he's just this big, big, profound thinker, a challenging and uncomfortable thinker. Uh, and I've, I've said this often, but I think unfortunately he's been reduced oftentimes in our public discourse to a few convenient, comfortable, positive slogans like I have a dream, um, which are important and they're powerful, but not nearly as encompassing um, the, the full range of his vast vision. And so there's a lot of things that we're a lot less comfortable about with, when it comes to doc, Dr. King in terms of remembering what he was really about and just how radical he was. His words around poverty alleviation and against war and against militarism. But I, I think they're so critical. And so um, Martin Luther King in his completeness has been a huge influence on me as an artist and as an activist. And decades ago, I had the opportunity to meet um, Reverend Dr. Bernice King. That's his youngest daughter. Um, she uh, is someone who I'm proud to call my friend and whom I consider really the premier civil rights leader of our time. Today, she's the CEO of the King Center in Atlanta, which represents the living legacy of both her father and her mother. And so this project, Will Your Heart Pass the Test, which we're talking about today with our um, esteemed guests, uh, it was really inspired in part by um, a lot of things we've discussed so far, but also my conversations with her, um, also by watching different things that were happening in, in the news, uh, thinking about and being a part of the uh, technology scene and also being disturbed by some things that I see, yet hopeful of others that I want to anticipate into the near future. And, you know, our uh, society is, is really troubled right now. We have Black people and people of color getting murdered on the streets uh, by police. We have Asian elderly um, that are getting smashed, burned, stabbed to death on our neighborhood sidewalks. Um, just in terms of the hate crimes against Asian Americans, by the way, I'm, I can't even tell you how astounding it is how many people that I directly know in my own network that um, have uh, been on the receiving end of a hate crime either this year or last year. I was just talking to the CEO of a major tech company who, who was uh, attacked in Oakland recently. So there's, it's very real and countless are being harassed and, in, and really enduring intolerable injustice and abuse on a daily basis. And we need to do something about it. It's this notion of, will your heart pass the test? Um, will our heart pass the test? Well, we're certainly not passing the test when we see all these things that are going and happening uh, all around us. But we do have the opportunity to ask ourselves that question, to introspect, to reflect. And it's actually a privilege to be able to do that because at the end of the day, we only get one final chance to ask that question, which represents the summation of our life. So that's the King Center. And then for Stop AAPI Hate, it's an organization and a movement that in the last year or so has, has really helped shape the narrative against these horrible acts of hate and violence on the Asian American community and Asian community globally. One of the um, ugliest offsprings of the pandemic and also a, a problem that is not going away as coronavirus dies down, as we see a lot of geopolitical tensions looming on the horizon between China and the US. It's really like a freight train that's coming in our direction. So uh, it, is a, it is a very pressing top of mind issue. And I'm very proud that uh, you know 100% of the proceeds of this NFT are going to uh, the King Center and Stop AAPI Hate. This is a massive gesture. I wanna give a shout out of appreciation and, and, and kudos to Disney, Lucasfilm, Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, XLab, uh, because they have um, really stepped up along with my studio. This is not, oh, we're giving 5% or 10% or 25% or even 50%. This is 
100%. And at that, it's, it's not even a small project. It's a massive project that, as I've said, has been about six months of, of continuous work. And it's about the funds we want to raise for these two causes, but it's also about making a larger statement about the NFT space as a whole, that we want to say that quality is important, artistry is important, um, that really taking a stance against racism and misogyny um, is important in this space as well. Well, I know for sure, Drew, um, a group of people, a very large group of people, from what I hear you saying, uh, whose heart is going to pass the test. And I really (laughs) have to commend you and all of your colleagues for doing this, um, working so hard for so long and mm-hmm. then directing these funds, uh, which as I said before, I hope will be very considerable to these two uh, great organizations who are doing so much good in this country. Um, and I don't, I don't want to ask you to repeat anything that you said before, but I have to say, Um, uh, in studying it and talking to you, I was truly amazed amazed at the number and significance of all the well-known sources of technical support um, you're getting for the project. And Mm -hmm. I I have two things, I mean, two things. Has there ever been a team like this assembled before Mm -hmm. to produce an NFT or, or to produce... I can't imagine any work of art and um, maybe the Statue of Liberty, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. But, um, and, you know, how, how did this support structure come about? You, didn't, you talked about that it existed, but how did it come about? Because not everyone can walk into George Lucas Film Studio and get the attention uh, you received for this project. So... Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm really uh, flabbergasted that that this all took place. Yeah, well, this project is really the culmination of so many projects and artworks over the years, and just the respect that um, Drew Kitaoka Studios has garnered in our space as being the leading full stack. Uh, studio in in Silicon Valley. And um, there's a number of organizations um, that know about us and and, and have relationships with us. And really, there's a a lot of opportunities to do things. I think that that the real constraint is time. Uh, And I think that Industrial Light and Magic is really a special organization. And we, you know, first met several years ago. And I, I actually started talking uh, with Vicki Dobbs Beck. She's uh, the executive in charge over there, a uh, very prominent uh, Lucasfilm executive. And she's an amazing person. She's uh, a woman really crushing it in the male dominated field of, of visual effects. And we've always, you know, been talking or we've been talking for some time about working together and uh, things kind of coalesce into our conversation uh, with the pandemic accelerating things and, and virtualizing all of them. And the time just seemed right to really um, work on a project like, like this. I think it's, I appreciate you talking about a kind of the scope of our effort. I think that that point can't really be uh, belabored because, you know, in the NFT space, um, there's uh, a number of, of talented people uh, working uh, and you might see a, a piece created by one person or two people or maybe three or four, but to have um, 40 people who are all leveraging the apex of their talent in whatever their specialty is, all kind of working under my creative direction alongside with uh, support from Tim Alexander, who. Uh, is the visual effects sp- supervisor over at Industrial Light and Magic. He is a uh, a guru, a legend, a- amazing guy. He's he was the visual effects uh, su- supervisor for films like Jurassic Park and 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 so on and so forth. Um, I just think that this piece is unprecedented in the NFT space and frankly unmatched by few art projects, maybe in the last hundred years, at least probably more. 
And so there's there's programmers, there's visual artists, there's animators, there's sound specialists, um, so many people working to accomplish something not only stunning, but something that we hope will stand the test of time. And when you see the file on the philips.com slash pass the test website, you'll see that this is um, a file that is playing as a movie file and that it's actually designed to loop. And um, technically the way that we uh, aligned all the, all the frames and all the different pieces of, of the work uh, this is actually something that was actually quite hard to achieve. We did a clubhouse session where we talked about the technical aspect of this for, for about 12 minutes, which I won't go into now. Uh, but what you see in that movie file, those, uh, the heart, the scale, the feather, they actually exist in, in three-dimensional space, or you could say four, 4D because there's that element of time. And, uh, uh, they all have r real world coordinates, if you will. So one of the things that we are considering doing um, is in the future, building a virtual reality experience uh, of, this, uh, of this piece later, which I think would be quite fascinating from a cultural and even educational uh, point of view. Yeah. Um, all I can think of is actually um, that I was the model for one of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park <laughs> <laughs> at, this, at this point. Um, I, love, I love it. I mean, I, I knew there was a reason that's one of my favorite movies. And uh, well, oh, there, there you go. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I've had a lot of conversations with, with Tim Alexander, who I just spoke about, about because he worked on Jurassic Park. And um, they most recently, uh, in, in, in one of the most recent Jurassic Parks, they used people in motion capture suits to yeah. get some of the dinosaur movement. And they, were, they, used, they used dancers. So it's possible, Arnold, you could have been in there. Yeah, well, I'm not telling. I'm not telling. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I, I'm, a lot of the people who come to my talks and panel discussions and uh, certainly all of my podcasts over the last two years um, are, are kind of more in my mode of learning and understanding. And so I, I want to get as much out of this conversation for them as I can. So it kind of in addition to the truly amazing technical complexity of this work, what other critical issues that collectors uh, should be looking for in Will Your Heart Pass the Test? Um, you know, we, we, when we talk about a, from an Impressionist painting to Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. this kind of a lexicon of things mm -hmm. that you, you look for in not just the good, but the great works of art. Mm -hmm. So what should they be what should be their guideposts mm -hmm. in going forward and understanding what this is and then bidding on it um, for so many different reasons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we are setting a new standard for quality and, and artistry and, and technical sophistication, I believe. And I think that, um, as this space moves so fast and we're just going to see this explosion of all these things, as you were saying, you were in Miami, Arnold, and you, you couldn't trip over a person without them talking about NFTs this year. Right. But, right. um, you know, really many of the NFT artworks are not going to last and they're not going to have enduring value. They're going to be a lot more like fast fashion items, very hot and trendy right now, sometimes funny, sometimes kitschy, sometimes clever, sometimes even offensive uh, or edgy, but in most likelihood, time is not going to smile favorably on a lot of them. And they're going to know about, we know about offensive, but let's go on from there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, it's time is, is, is not going to uh, smile, smile favorably on them. And, and I think they're going to have trouble preserving their value. Um, that's not the case here. I think we've, we've created the artwork with 100% dedication to creating enduring value. And I don't just mean financial value, but also creative, artistic, philosophical, and technological value. And 
um, I, I believe that time will smile favorably on works like this. And so when you talk about ways that people can look at this, I mean, you're talking about Monet and you're talking about the Impressionists who were masters of light. And we see the same thing in this piece. The, um, uh, the, the number of people that consulted on just the physics of the behavior of the light and how we worked and worked and worked around the light, the way that the light, for example, I'm just looking at this right now, would um, glance and glean off of these uh, cables that are holding the scales. Um, my model for this uh, was that I wanted the light to look very much like the light that plays on spider webs when um, there's dew in the morning and the light is kind of amazing gliding down. And this was very hard. We went through probably five iterations of just looking at the light on the uh, cable and um, making sure that it was delicate and that we had this feeling of suspension um, and, and tension and that the light was the same thing with the, the light moving through the um, bottom of the scales that's holding up the uh, a heart uh, and even kind of the fine uh, grain of the texture of uh, you can see when you not right now on the zoom because this is being filtered through Zoom, which is down downsizing the resolution. But if you actually look at the actual file on, um, on the blockchain, you'll see in 4K resolution, the level of, of detail and texture of like the grittiness of the sand and the, the wall and the sandstone and all of these things. And there's really interesting things. There's this mysterious door that's sliding in the background that different things open up and kind of peek through uh, in a mysterious way. Yeah, um, uh, I can't wait myself to uh, spend more time with it. Um, um, it, in terms of the acquisition of this, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that you've spoken to my colleagues on a number of occasions, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the bidding process? Mm -hmm. And then if it's not revealing uh, a secret, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned some additional rewards mm -hmm. uh, involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Could you, is that possible yeah. to talk a little bit more about that as well? Well, when we get together tete a tete with Arnold Lehman, secrets are spilled. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why people have to tune in for these, these, these webinars and they don't get even posted online. So um, it's, it's kind of like we're all having some tea together uh, in this virtual format. So I'm happy to share. I think um, one of the things that's most important is that people register to bid early. Uh, this is a function yeah, of that's auction. That's really happening. important, really important. Really important. And I think that there's probably 90% of, of people on this call who, who, who know that, but there may be an important 10% that don't know that and that don't know that with the auction houses, it can take up to 24 to 48 hours for you to get approved. Now it may be less, but you don't want to get to the last day, which is the 15th, which is very early on the West coast, by the way, because the auction closes at 9 AM in the morning. You don't want to get there ready to bid and then be shut out because you weren't approved. So I, my number one tip for people is register to bid early um, it's something that's, uh, good for you. It's good for the auction. The, the other thing is in terms of the, um, top bidder, they're going to receive a beautiful companion physical piece of art, um, that is a still from the NFT in gorgeous 4K resolution, vibrantly printed on this luminous metal surface that has this wood um, backing that kind of lets the, the image just kind of float off the wall. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of NFTs are purely digital, but with this one, we're also kind of gonna let people have their cake and eat it too. So they- So I can, so Drew, so I can ask my wife, to move the work of art from the living room to the dining room. 
Exactly, exactly. And uh, you can be immortalized into the blockchain with this piece, but also have something um, physical to uh, show guests when they come over to your home. Um, but it's not just that. that, uh, that and, and so that that piece, that physical companion piece, which is about, I think, like 42 inches or something like that, the, the actual dimensions are are on the website. Um, there's that. And that's in the, the Phillips catalog. But on top of that, and this is not in the Phillips catalog, but this is just uh, me um, offering this. Uh, the first person to bid above 50% of the what ends up being the final winning bid, and the first person to bid what ends up being above 25% of the final winning bid are both going to get um, a smaller uh, gorgeous print printed on, on this kind of luminous metal surface, kind of like a, a, a smaller version of this. So even if you don't win the auction, you can still be a winner, um, in a couple ways, uh, helping us climb the ladder here and really, uh, uh contributing to the, the, the end result of this whole project, but also the opportunity to win one of these two smaller prints. And so, just keep in mind that most of the action were, is going to happen in the final hour. So jumping in now, even if you're not the top bidder, will likely get you qualified for both awards. And the, and the more bids you place, the higher your chances of winning. So I think uh, that's pretty cool. Um, amazing. Amazing. Um, and I think a lot of people who do who participate in a lot of auctions are going to say to themselves, well, why doesn't this happen when I'm bidding on a Cezanne? Um, <laughs> or, so, you know, we're going to have to leave that for another day. But um, we are running out of time. So I want to ask you, I combine some of my questions that I, that I still have for you. Um, and that is, what brought you the greatest satisfaction in doing this? What was the what you know got got you jumping out of bed every day into the studio or off to uh, uh, Lucas and getting this ready? Yes, well, sometimes uh, in this process, I've just collapsed on the floor. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, you asked that was my to... that was my second question. That <laughs> was my question about what's your plan for December sixteenth, the day <laughs> after the auction. <laughs> Collapsing again back on the floor, but then uh, getting getting back up again and and moving on to the next uh, piece because there's actually there's um, uh, a, a number of interesting inquiries of people who've reached out just through the visibility of this piece that are like, oh my gosh, can, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? So kind of kind of just look at everything on the dashboard and see where where we want to go. But um, you know, would I do this all over again? Uh, I, I absolutely, I would do it in a heartbeat. You know, it, 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 it wasn't easy, but I think anything meaningful is not going to be a walk in the park. No, and absolutely, you know, um, you, you've, you've built so many extraordinary things in the art world yourself. And you know, about how it feels to go through those struggles and challenges, but how rewarding it is when you you know, you, you get to the end. So it was amazing and it was incredible. And for me, um, I, 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 I've, I, I'm trying to imagine, you know, Michelangelo, um, you know, being up there on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and, and, and trying to bring all of his tools together and, and, and help that he needed to create something amazing and supernatural. And, you know, for us in the process, we pushed the boundaries on what is possible um, and we created at the very frontier of what technologies allow. And in the process, I think we built some of the tools and the techniques of tomorrow. Um, you know, there's really nothing that can compare to the feeling of doing this. And it, it, it involves sleepless nights and, and nerve wracking moments. It probably, I probably have like an additional gray hair or two, um, but <laughs> to be able to create something, um, so ambitious and, and so sublime, um, really, uh, it was 100% worth it. And so I would do it again. And actually, we need to do it again. These digital worlds are coming together fast and furious. And Facebook is betting on the metaverse and renaming itself meta. Um, you know, all these different industries are, are rushing in 
So we need to think um, as artistic leaders, as cultural leaders, as social leaders, are our worlds of tomorrow going to be filled by, by commercial spam and, and trolley, you know, trash? Or are we going to fill them atom by atom, pixel by pixel with the um, Sistine chapels of our time? So um, I, I, I say, you know, yes, uh, let's, let's, let's do it again. And um, well, you know, I have to, true. I think that's a great parallel, a really great parallel. And I, I want to say that this has been an incredibly delightful and, and, and instructive experience for me in talking with you. And I, I can't imagine that that isn't the same thing that all our viewers um, had in their experience in this very, very short hour that went by like, you know, five minutes ago. Um, and it is, um, it's really been a pleasure. And I want to, in this last few seconds that we have, not only to thank you, but to thank everyone from all over the country and all over the world for joining us this evening. Uh, the auction of Will Your Heart Pass the Test ends on December 15. And again, if you would like to register to bid, as Drew said, bid early. Please go to phillips.com slash pass the test. And if you have any further questions about the auction, please contact my colleague, Rebecca Bowling at Phillips. Her email is rbowling at phillips.com. Um, the only other thing I want to say is that um, my guest has been the incredible artist, Drew Kadioka. I'm Arnold Lehman for Phillips, and I want to wish everyone a happy, healthy, and peaceful holidays ahead. Thank Arnold, you so much. Can I say something real quick? Of course. Yes, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you're a real beacon in the space, and it's super exciting to see you jump into NFTs, and, and your voice is going to be extremely impactful. also want to give a huge shout out to Rebecca, Jamie, Elizabeth, Anna, um, Alexis. Uh, these, these women are rock stars, and they are really rocking the NFT space, so but we should watch uh, what, they, what they do in the uh, I wouldn't even say years because it's like weeks, months, because everything moves so fast week over week in this space. I will. I want to thank everyone who joined us. And uh, I want to say that if anyone has any further questions, they can find me on Instagram at Drew Kataoka, on Twitter at Drew Kataoka, and at my website, drue.net, drew.net. And we're happy to take questions or answer any of those questions uh, uh, there. And um, finally, uh, I, uh, Arnold, I just want to share this quote with you, which I love and uh, maybe leave it with everyone with that is, uh, was quoted in, in the famous uh, series, Civilization, comes from um, Ruskin. He said, great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts, the book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their art. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the others, but of the three, the only trustworthy one is the last. Well, thank you so much, Drew. And I think I'm speaking for everyone who's been online with us this evening or this morning or this afternoon. Again, thank you all. Bye-bye.